My name is Skye and my story started in 1986 when I was born in Cape Town. Um, most people do know my story because I've always been open about it from a very young age. It's never been something that I've been shy to tell or felt like I needed to hide it from people. My parents were both drug addicts. They were obviously involved with the wrong crowd, um, party mode, drug mode, but they weren't just the normal weekend drug addicts. They were actually proper drug addicts. They did whatever they wanted to do to get hold of drugs. Um, yeah, that is how they were. Um, until a point where they were both diagnosed with schizophrenia. My mom and my dad, they were diagnosed at separate times of their lives. Uh, my dad was diagnosed first and then my, my mother was diagnosed. My mother was 25 when she had me. At that stage, obviously, she wasn't in a very good condition because of the drugs. Um, and that is what I was born to, two drug-induced schizophrenics. So I did stay with my mother for the first six months until the welfare got involved um, and eventually took me away from my mother. She was deemed unfit to look after me. Um, she had already been to the psychiatric hospital in Cape Town and they had already said she's not able to look after a child. So they did take me from her and from there basically I went from home to home to home to home. To be exact, I moved 10 times in my life to 10 different homes and most of the time it was about two years per home. It wasn't necessarily people that I didn't know, but that didn't mean that it wasn't still uh, something to adapt to when I moved in because it's still different people, it's still different households, it's still different families that you have to adapt to. Life in the children's home was quite crazy. Um, <laughs> actually, it was really crazy. Um, I remember the first day I went to the children's home. I was 11 years old. And I remember I didn't want to go there. So I wasn't very happy when I was placed there. It was another environment to adapt to, but this time it was a whole house full of children that I had to live with. And Luckily for me, I've made friends from a very young age, so I made friends immediately. And in the children's home, I had my best friend, who I'm still friends with today. And we had our room and we locked our bedroom and locked our cupboards and everything when we left our room, like we were, our room was our safe haven. If you don't have friends in the children's home, you will suffer because your friends are basically your support and you need to be in a clique when you're in a children's home. A children's home isn't the kind of place where you wanna walk around on your own. The children's home itself wasn't a bad place to stay. Um, it was a safe place. It's a place of safety for kids that don't have, you know, parents or family or whatever. So it wasn't, a, they did what they were supposed to be doing. And that is what a children's home is there for, is to take care of all your basic needs, to make sure that you're safe and you have a roof over your head and you've got food in your stomach and you're in school and you're doing your homework and all of that. So that was perfect. And that is what children's home do their best to provide for kids like us. But it definitely doesn't fulfill a child's emotional needs being there. Like everything else that you need is there, except your emotional needs are not taken care of. So the kids that grew up in the children's home still struggle as adults when they leave the children's home because those are the things that they now have to deal with that they never got as a child. I don't really have bad memories of the children's home. It's just that because I didn't want to be there, um, I did rebel. So things kind of went downhill for me there because I wasn't the innocent child anymore that I used to be before I was put there. I started smoking at the age of 11, started drinking. My friends and I started running away for weekends. We would hitchhike to the most dangerous areas um, at night. We would break burglar bars off climb out of our windows on the top floor, climb down walls, run out of the children's home, hitchhike, be picked up by strange men. Um, we would stop at bars with them. They would buy us alcohol and we didn't see anything wrong with it because for us, we were like, it's cool. We're getting free alcohol. We didn't think of how dangerous it actually is to be getting in car with strangers, hitchhiking, 
We didn't think of the fact that we could have been raped, we could have been kidnapped, we could have been murdered. Anything could have happened to us. Um, some of these men even used to take us home with them um, and just make it like a party for us to entertain us. We never used to do anything with these men, but this is what happened. What helped me stay protected was besides God having his hand on me my whole life and protecting me, I've been blessed with the gift of discernment. So I was from a young age, I always could tell if I was if I was in an unsafe environment or if something was going to lead to something bad or you know if I just felt a bit uneasy and I didn't want to be there I would leave um, and we ran away so much that the last time we ran away when we got back they sent us to a reformatory which is which is almost like a kid's jail so we were sent there for two weeks my friends and I we were separated from each other and yeah that was kind of our punishment for running away and being disobedient or whatever and that was quite hectic that was quite a wake-up call because that was that wasn't even separate bedrooms that was like one big room like hall with beds um, the bathrooms were open the showers were open you'd have to shower naked in front of everybody and everything was open for everybody to see because that's how they make sure that a child's not going to kill someone or, you know, attack somebody or whatever. Um, and there were some really dangerous kids that we stayed with. Luckily, I was only there for two weeks and then I left, but I didn't go back to the children's home. I can't look back and say I hated the children's home. I learned a lot there and yes, I did become rebellious there, but it's a part of my life that was there. I can't regret it either. It was an experience. Um, I stayed with two different friends in high school and then eventually I moved in with my boyfriend when I was in matric. By the time I reached matric, I knew that I didn't want to study. All I wanted to do was start working, earn my own income and move into my own home. I didn't want to live with people anymore. Um, I didn't want to have to depend on people anymore. I was driven to get my independence. So by the time I reached 21, I was already working for three years. So I got myself my own little granny flat and I paid my own bills and I did my budgets every month on a small little salary and that is how I survived. And I loved it because I had my own space, my own home, nobody could tell me what to do and that is exactly what I wanted. I didn't only work hard, but I also partied hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, I was very much still in party mode, still going out every weekend, drinking, partying, drank quite a lot. I uh, used to drink from like the Friday to the Sunday, go clubbing with my friends. I had a lot of friends um, and I was just still very much in fun party mode. So, um, but then while I, while I was working, I did meet somebody else. And this man that I started dating, he was such a chilled guy. He was, he didn't smoke, he didn't drink. He was just such a chilled guy. So when we started dating, he actually changed my life for the better because he showed me a whole other side of life. He really calmed me down a lot because yeah, I, need, I think I needed that balance. I stopped smoking. I wasn't drinking anymore as much. Um, when I say drinking, I was never an alcoholic, but I wasn't drinking every weekend, partying anymore that was all over but I did start realizing that there was something missing in my life because my whole life I cruised through my whole life I got through my childhood very easily but and nothing ever bothered me I never found it difficult to move from home to home I never found it difficult not having parents not having that family environment was never an issue for me but then suddenly when I reached the age of 27, 28, I did start feeling but there's something wrong here, like there's something missing and I wasn't sure what it was. I just knew that there was something that wasn't right. So here I was sitting with a situation where I could feel like there was something missing that needed to be fulfilled. I wasn't sure what was happening to me. It wasn't a very nice stage for me. Um, I started suffering from a bit of depression, but without like taking it seriously, like just feeling like a bit depro, not feeling great um, and all of that. And I just, I knew that 
I had to start doing something to kind of take care of that part of whatever was happening to me. Um, I didn't know how to um, because I refused to go to a doctor, refused to go to psychologists and psychiatrists and like get put on medication like I just told myself it's something I'll never ever do because of my parents and seeing what they went through. I just knew that something's wrong and something needs to be taken care of. I went to go visit this church in Cape Town and music has always been part of my life. Um, from the beginning of primary school I was in a choir, I did piano lessons and all other kinds of extramural activities but obviously I loved the choir and I loved music and because I've always had a musical ear from a very young age and I've always had a connection with songs and lyrics I got saved through the song Anchor. The lyrics of that song stuck with me. Um, and the, because I was in a time of my life where I wanted to make a change and I was determined to make a positive change, a good change for my life, and that song started with those lyrics that in every season, in every change you are near, that was when I started trusting, started feeling like I could trust this path. And that is actually what made me go back again. So it was the lyrics together with the maturity of the voice, together with like just the whole atmosphere. It was very comforting. It was like a safe place. So I started going to church every Sunday and I decided that this was going to be something that, or a place that I wanted to come to every week. I still knew that even though my life had gotten a lot better, I still wasn't where I was supposed to be. A lot needed to change still in order for me to really have the future that I wanted for myself. And that's when I decided that I'm gonna to move to Joburg and make a proper clean slate. And that's exactly what I did. I just moved here and I knew my church was here in Joburg as well. So that's where I went to immediately. And till today, I'm still in the same church. That is how I landed up singing and, you know, um, wanting to serve God in the ministry. That was the big turning point for me because that is really where I just started throwing myself into church, wanting to know more about God, growing spiritually, which obviously leads you to a much better lifestyle as well. I don't really know what I see for the future, but I do know that I'm determined to make the most of my future and use all the gifts that God has given me for my future. Um, I do believe God gave me my life and my story for a reason. So I'm just gonna continue to follow God, continue to grow spiritually, um, and just continue to serve Him by using whatever He's given me. So in that sense, if God blessed me with a voice to sing, then I have to sing. If God blessed me with a gift with kids, the connection that I have with children, and it means that I have to fill my home with kids and adopt kids, then that's what I have to do. My relationship with my mother was pretty good to me because I knew my mother from birth. It's not that I never knew my mother or that I went to homes and I never saw my mother again. My mother was always there from when I was born to all the homes that I went through. I remember my mother would come and visit me. She knew I was her daughter even though she was sick um, and I always knew that my mother was sick. So I don't remember a time where I didn't know that my mother was sick. So I think that that was something very good that whoever was looking after me at the time did by just telling me from the beginning, not hiding it until a certain age when the child, you think the child is ready to accept the information. I don't believe in any of that because I think that does more damage than anything else to a child. Rather just teach a child from the beginning or show, be honest with a child from the beginning. Um, that really worked for me because I knew who my mother was, I knew she was sick, I knew what sickness she had and I knew, learned how to handle her from a very young age and it wasn't difficult for me because to me that was normal. So for me there wasn't like this perfect mother that then turned into a woman with schizophrenia. So I had a good relationship with my mother, I used to be very bossy with her when I was younger. 
<laughs> I used to look after her because she was more like the baby, put it that way. She wasn't really a baby, she was just more in her own world. Um, I remember her being very depressed. She was, most of the time, she was just sitting peacefully. She wouldn't disrupt anybody. I do remember days where she would be speaking to herself. She would be talking to whatever she was listening to in her head, which was obviously the schizophrenia. But to me, that was normal. Again, I knew my mother was sick, so I'd just be like, okay, it's fine, she's talking to herself again. She used to come visit me in the children's home with my grandfather. Um, in the other homes that I was in after that, obviously she went a bit downhill, so I didn't see her as much. Um, and then when my grandfather passed away, she really went downhill. That's when she went from like year to year. She went complete downhill. She landed up being on and off of the streets. She lost weight, her teeth started falling out. Her hair was like messed up. Sometimes when I would see her, there would be patches of hair pulled out of her head because of her walking the streets. Her life went downhill for her between the age of 40 and 50 until I got her into the facility at the age of 50, which was a huge mission to get her in there. It was back and forth to the psychiatric hospitals and sitting with a social worker, getting her stable on her medication, getting her to adapt to this new environment of being in this facility. It took her two it took two full years for that to happen, but that facility literally changed her life or changed the last seven years of her life. So um, they really cleaned her up well. I mean, really, they did a great job with her. And I have peace today because she passed away and she was taken care of and she was stable mentally. I still visited her. With my father, I didn't know my fa who my father was my whole life until the age of 24. So I got this inbox message while I was at work out of the blue. And it was just a message from my dad's sister saying, Hi Sky, I'm your dad's sister, I'm your aunt, and you've got a grandmother and you've got a cousin and your mom and your dad dated for six years and I haven't seen your family in years. And I was just like, oh my gosh, where does this come from? Okay, so I replied and I just said, I don't know who he is. Like, have no idea where to find him or who he is. From there on, that's how I got in touch with my father's side of the family and I met all of them. That was also the first time I saw a photo of my father and also the first time they all met me, they were all in shock because apparently I look so much like my father. I've got the eyes and everything from him. And um, so, yeah, I started spending time with them. And in that time, I decided I wanted to meet my father. At that time, he was living on the street. Um, he was an outpatient of the psychiatric hospital for most of his life as well and he was living on the street so i said to my aunt i want to go find him in the street i just want to see what he looks like because now everybody's like shocked when they see me because i look like him so i don't need a relationship and i won't be scared to meet him because i know what to expect i know what my mother looks like so if he looks anything like my mother i've got nothing to be worried about <laughs> so um, so we went driving around in the, in the streets the one day and we couldn't find him and then just after that we went to the shop and then as we got out of the car my aunt was like there he is, there he's sitting and then I was like oh my gosh. So we went up to him and we met him and he was sitting on the pavement and he knows his family very well and he knew my aunt very well. Um, she did used to see him in the street often and she used to give him money and she would greet him, it's her brother. So my aunt never de denied the fact that he was her brother. Her and I are quite similar in that sense because I also don't believe in writing someone off because they've got a disability or they're on the street or whatever. Everybody's got family history. Not everybody's as open as, about it as me. <laughs> so um, my aunt, yeah, we went up to him, we greeted him, he immediately recognized her and he thought that I was my cousin because my cousin and I are exactly the same age. And we also have like similar features and stuff like that. And she said to him, no, Callan, this is Skye, this is your daughter. And then he looked up and his face just like 
dropped, but he was sitting on the pavement looking up at me like this and his face just like dropped and he went like dead quiet and he went, oh, hello, Sky. And then I said, hello. And for me, I wasn't shocked to see him at all. I could see that he felt a bit uncomfortable because he knows I'm his daughter. He knows he has a daughter because when I was born in one of the foster homes, him and my mother used to come fetch me as well for weekends, but then they would drop me off dirty and all of that because they were on drugs and stuff. So, um, so my aunt and I, we decide, okay, we're going to greet him and go do our shopping. And we, he asks for some money. So my aunt says, okay, fine. She'll bring him money when we come out. So we walked into the, into the shop. And as we were walking into the shop, I just like looked behind me to see like, cause I'm checking like how he's sitting. And as I looked behind me, he was also sitting there <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> so we like hit each other eye contact. And then it was almost like he was a bit shocked. And then we went into the shop, got our stuff, came out, gave the money. But when we came out and we gave him the money, it was like he couldn't look at me after that. I've always known from a very young age that I'm completely normal, there's nothing wrong with me. I've always just told myself that I do have to be careful with what I experiment with. Look, I did have my party years, so, and I did experiment, but thankfully I stopped. But I've always known that I'm completely normal. It wasn't a case of what I thought about myself. I've always known I'm fine, my parents are not okay, and that's okay, um, but I'm fine. Um, I think it was more other people that made me doubt. If anybody made me doubt my sanity, it was other people that would maybe say things to me without realizing the damage that they're actually causing by telling me something like that. Um, I don't think that people thought I was crazy because I came from two schizophrenics. I do think that people were a bit skeptical of me because I came from two schizophrenics. and. Also, it could have possibly been the case that people were very worried about how I was going to turn out because I came from two schizophrenics. So I was actually a risk going into anybody's home because nobody knew how I was going to turn out in the end. And I'm sure that most people did think, I really did feel at a point that people did think that I was not going to make it in life. Um, I was going to be a failure or a drug addict, but I proved everybody wrong. I had a lot of friends. I really had a lot of friends. Um, my friends kind of helped me forget about everything that I was going through in high school. I had so many friends. We were just having fun. We were partying. Yes, it was a lot, but, but they really distracted me from real life. And they kind of helped me through that chapter. And then obviously I went into my next relationship which also had a very positive effect on my life because he showed me a healthier side of life um, and just being able to maintain those friendships has given me a good support structure so um, that but also I'm a very structured person So one of the most frequently asked questions I've had throughout my life is people asking me, how did I grow up so well? Um, or how have I turned out so well um, after everything I've been through? And it's really by the grace of God that I've made it this far. Um, I really give all glory to God. Um, I do acknowledge as well that I had a lot of help growing up. There were a lot of people that try to help the situations that I was in and you know people opening up their homes to me but at the end of the day it was I it was me that had to make a decision um, you know to take control and decide what I want to do with my life I took responsibility I didn't blame people I never blamed people for where I am I kind of just looked at my life and I thought you know Sky this is your life you have a decision you need to decide what you want to do with it Growing up, I did start realizing um, things about my life. My childhood did start catching up with me in my late 20s. I started realizing, oh my gosh, 
this is this is what's in my life this is what's not in my life and this is what my life actually is and facing those realities were hard but thankfully for me during that time I discovered God and so with God I was able to work through those things that I had to deal with um, I had to accept the fact that my life was different and I had to understand that not everybody there're going to be very few people that understand me in life so for me that's why it's important to walk closely with God because God is the one who understands me God is the one who knows my heart God is the one who knows why I react to certain things the way that I do very few people will understand that about me um and just accepting that and realizing that it's okay to be different it's okay to have a different life there's nothing wrong with you having a complete different life to most people the most important thing the the absolute most 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 important thing that saved me was actually forgiveness because you do go through situations where people are nasty and you have to forgive those people um if i really believe that if i wasn't able to forgive then i probably would have killed myself because of the anger build up reaching a point where you're able to forgive is a journey for some people it comes easy and for some people it's difficult. So for me as a child it was very easy. For some reason I just always forgave people growing up. I wasn't somebody who held a grudge. I was withdrawn, but I wasn't unforgiving. So the moment somebody else was nice with me, I would be fine with them no matter what they did to me. And to me that was the normal way of growing up. But growing up those things catch up with you. and you have to deal with those things because i realized i had a lot of anger that built up that i had to work through i had to work through a lot of emotions towards people because of that i struggled to trust a lot of people and you just have to constantly go back to god and you just have to constantly walk with god through those emotions um it's really a lot of work but it's absolutely necessary If you cannot accept it if you cannot admit that this is something that you're dealing with then you have a problem. I would say my relationship with God is linked to my commitment. When I say commitment, I mean I'm committed to church. I'm in morning services, evening services. I serve I I'm in every conference. I don't want to miss a prayer night and it's not because I feel like I have to be there. It's because I want to be there. That is my time with God. And then of course, um yeah, just just walking with God every day. I love my worship. I can spend time at home, you know, 3 hours in worship on my own on my lounge floor. There's nothing wrong with that for me. I absolutely love it. One of the biggest things for me was coming to the realization that God gave me gifts and my life has a purpose. So obviously it was a journey that I went on with God where God showed me but sky you have your story for a reason. God gave me the musical ear for a reason. God gave me this connection that I have with kids for a reason. So when people ask me Where am I today? How do I handle my today life? That is how I handle my today life. Those are the things that keeps me busy.